Recorded Books Incorporated presents an unabridged recording of The Cat Who Saw Stars by Lillian Jackson Braun, narrated by George Guedel. This work is copyrighted 1998 by Lillian Jackson Braun. This recording is copyrighted 1999 by Recorded Books Incorporated. Quillerin, Coco, and Yum Yum are hoping for an untroubled month of July spent sitting on the porch of their cabin by a lake in Mooseville. It's not that far from home, but far enough away from the hustle and bustle of pickaxe that Quill figures he might actually find some peace and quiet. But all is not well 400 miles north of everywhere, for there are some very strange visitors prowling the neighborhood. And now... Cat Who Saw Stars. Chapter One. World-shaking news was seldom broadcast by WPKX, the radio station serving Moose County, 400 miles north of everywhere. Local baseball scores, another car accident, a fire in a chicken coop, and death notices were the usual fare. In late June, listeners snapped to attention then when a Sunday evening newscast included this bulletin. An unidentified backpacker of no known address may or may not be a missing person, according to Moose County authorities. The Caucasian male, thought to be in his early 20s, stowed his camping gear on private property in the Fishport area three days ago and has not returned. He is described as fair-haired, with blue eyes, and of medium build. When last seen, he was wearing cut-off jeans, a white t-shirt, and a camera on a neck strap. Anyone seeing an individual of this description should notify the sheriff's department. Since the description might fit any number of vacationers in Moose County, the listening audience ignored the matter until the next day, when it was reported in the local newspaper. A detailed story written in folk style by Jill Handley, feature editor of the Moose County Something, made sense of the incident. Where's David? Missing Hiker Baffles Fishport by Jill Handley. Magnus Hawley of Fishport, a veteran on the commercial fishing boats, flagged down a sheriff's patrol car on Sunday and told a curious tale. Hawley and his wife Doris live in a trailer home surrounded by flower beds on Lakeshore Road near Roaring Creek. T'other night, Hawley said, me and my wife had just ate supper and was watching TV when there come a knock on the door. I goes to the door and it's a young feller with a big backpack wanting to pitch his tent down by the creek for a couple of nights. He says he's going to do some hiking on the beach. He's kind of sweaty and dusty, you know, but he has a regular haircut and talks decent. Doris Hawley approved of the stranger. He reminded me of our grandson. Nice smile, very polite. I asked if he would be hunting for agates on the beach because I could suggest a good spot, but he said he was mostly interested in taking pictures. His camera looked expensive, and I thought maybe he was a professional photographer. We told him he could camp near the picnic table at the bottom of the hill so long as he didn't throw trash in the creek or play loud music. The stranger said his name was David. I never knew a David who wasn't trustworthy, she said. She gave him some of her homemade ginger snaps and filled a jug with fresh water from the well. Her husband told David it was okay to take a dip in the creek, but warned him about slippery rocks and strong current. Shortly after, they saw the young man heading for the lake shore with his camera. Funny thing, though, said Hawley. After that, we didn't see hide or hair, the feller. I went down to the creek in a couple of days to see if he'd cleared out. The water jug, it was still on the picnic table, full up, and his pack was underneath, all strapped and buckled. Only thing gone was the cookies. We talked about it, Doris and me. I said he could have took up with somebody he met on the beach. There's no telling what kids will do these days, you know. But my wife was worried about him slipping on the rocks and getting drowned, so I hailed the patrol car. A sheriff's deputy and a state trooper inspected the campsite, but found no identification of any kind. A description of the hiker, as given by the Hawleys, was broadcast Sunday night, but no response to the bulletin had been received at press time. 
Following the appearance of the story, the local gossip mill started grinding out idle speculations and inventing sensational details. Abduction was a possibility, many said, nodding their heads wisely. A few busybodies suspected the Hollies of foul play. Don't eat any ginger snaps was the popular quip in bars and coffee shops. One who listened to the gossip without contributing to it was Jim Quillen, a longtime journalist now writing a twice-weekly column for The Something. Only recently he had interviewed Hawley and other commercial fishermen, even spending time on the lake with a hard-working crew and a half-ton of slippery fish, and he resented the malicious whispers. Yet that was to be expected in a community polarized between boaters and landlubbers. Quillerin's own reaction to the backpacker's disappearance was an educated curiosity. Formerly a crime reporter in major cities around the United States, he had retained a Sherlockian interest in solving mysteries. Quillerin was a popular man about town in Pickaxe City, the county seat, population 3,000. His column, straight from the quill pen, was set to rate 90% readership, more than the daily horoscope. Wherever he went in the county, he drew attention, being a good-looking 50-plus and a well-built 6 feet 2 with a mustache of outstanding proportions. It had a droop that accentuated his melancholy demeanor, and his eyes had a brooding intensity. Yet friends knew him to be amiable, witty, willing to do favors, and fond of taking them to dinner. There was something else in Quillerin's favor. He was a philanthropist of incredible generosity. Earlier in life, he had been a hard-working journalist down below, as locals called the high population centers around the country. He lived from paycheck to paycheck, with no thought of accumulating wealth. Then, a happenstance that was stranger than fiction made him the most affluent individual in the Northeast Central United States. He inherited the Klingenschein estate. The fortune had been amassed when the area was rich in natural resources and no one paid income tax. As for the original Klingenschein, he had operated a highly profitable business. To Quillerin, the very notion of all that money was a burden and actually an embarrassment, until he thought of establishing the Klingenschein Foundation. Now financial experts at the K Fund in Chicago managed the fortune, distributing it for the betterment of the community and leaving him free to write, read, dine well, and do a little amateur sleuthing. Town folk of every age and income bracket talked about him at clubs, on the phone, in supermarkets. They said, Swell fella, not stuck up at all, always says hello. Never know he was a billionaire. He sure can write. His column's the only thing in the paper I ever read. That's some mustache he's got. My wife says it's sexy, especially when he wears sunglasses. Wonder why he stays single. They say he lives in a barn with two cats. You'd think he'd get a proper house and a dog, even if he doesn't want a wife. Quillerin's oversized mustache was a virtual landmark in Moose County, admired by men and adored by women. Like his hair, it was turning gray, and that made it more friendly than fierce. What no one knew about was its peculiar sensitivity. Actually, it was the source of his hunches. Whenever faced with suspicious circumstances, he felt a nudge on his upper lip that prompted him to start asking questions. Frequently, he could be seen patting his mustache or grooming it with his fingertips or pounding it with his knuckles. It depended on the intensity of the nudge. Observers considered the gesture a nervous habit. Needless to say, it was not something Quillerin cared to explain, even to his closest friends. With the disappearance of the backpacker, a nagging sensation on his upper lip was urging him to visit Fishport, a modest village near the resort town of Mooseville, where he had a log cabin and a half mile of lake frontage. The cabin, part of his inheritance, was small and very old, but adequate for short stays in summertime. Only 30 miles from Pickaxe, its remoteness was more psychological than geographic. 
Mooseville, with its hundred miles of lake for a vista and with its great dome of sky, was a different world. Even the pair of Siamese with whom he lived responded to its uniqueness. A propitious fate had brought the three of them together. The female had been a poor little rich cat abandoned in a posh neighborhood when Quillerin found her. Because of her sweet expression and winning ways, he named her Yum Yum. The sleek, muscular male had simply moved in at a time when Quillerin was trying to get his life together. Kao Kokun had been his name before being orphaned. Now called Coco, he had a magnificent set of whiskers and remarkable sensory attributes. In fact, he and Quillerin had developed a kind of kinship. The one with a feline radar system and the other with an intuitive mustache. The day after the newspaper story about the backpacker, Quillerin drove downtown to the something office to announce his vacation plans and hand in his copy for the quill pen column. He had written a thousand words about the 4th of July from the viewpoint of Benjamin Franklin. How would poor Richard react to backyard barbecues and high school majorettes and silver tights? He found the managing editor's office decorated with crepe paper streamers and a sign daubed with the message, Happy Birthday, Junior. Today you are 16. Junior Goodwin, who was past 30, but slight stature and boyish features gave him the look of a perennial schoolboy. Happy 16th, Quillerin said. You don't look a day over 15. Dropping into a chair, he propped his right ankle on his left knee. Any coffee left? The editor swiveled in his chair and poured a mugful. Did you see our story in the backpacker, Quill? A teacher in Sawdust City called and laid us out for quoting the fisherman verbatim instead of correcting his grammar. What we printed is exactly how he said it. Jill had it all on tape. Pay no attention, she's a crank, Quillerin said. There's nothing wrong with a little local color to relieve the monotony of good English. I'm with you, Junior said. Then a guy called and complained because Holly's wife was quoted as speaking better than her husband. He called it gender bias. I've met them both. That's the way they speak, for Pete's sake. I'm glad I don't have your job, Junior. The sawdust city woman wants us to start running a column on correct speech instead of wasting so much space on sports. I quote, no one would read it. It would have to be chatty like Ann Landers. Well, anyway, what are you doing for the fourth? Leaving for a month's vacation at the beach. Are you taking the cats? Of course. The beach is cat heaven. The screened porches, they're cloud nine. I go up there for peace and quiet. They go for sounds and sights. Squawking gulls, peeping sandpipers, cawing crows, chipping chipmunks. And everything moves. Birds, butterflies, grasshoppers, waving beach grass, splashing waves. Sounds like fun, Junior said. And what will you be doing? Reading, loafing, biking, walking on the beach. Can you file your copy from up there? What? Does anyone have a fax machine you can use? You forget I'm going on vacation. I haven't had one since God knows when. But you know the readers have fits if your column doesn't run, and you boast you can write it with one hand tied behind your back. Well, only because it's your birthday. Did you read Jill's piece about the new restaurant up there? Yes, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. The new summer theater, too. Friday's opening night, Junior said. How would you like to review the play for us? He caught Quillerin's doer glance. I know it's your vacation, but you're a writer, and writers write the way other people breathe. How about it, Quill? You can review a play blindfold. Well, I'll think about it. Before leaving the building, Quillerin stopped in the publisher's office. He and Arch Riker had been lifelong friends and fellow journalists down below. Both had adapted to country living, but Arch had gone so far as to marry a local woman. Now his naturally florid face glowed with midlife contentment, and his paunchy midriff was getting paunchier. Mildred Riker was food writer for the paper. Quillerin asked, have you two moved to your beach house? Sure have. It's a longer commute, but worth it. There's something about the lake air that's invigorating. And intoxicating, Quillerin thought. The locals are all a little balmy, and the summer people soon get that way. 
He said, I'm packing up the cats and moving up there myself this afternoon. Polly will be gone all month, you know. Riker had his Mildred, and Quillerin had his Polly Duncan. She was the director of the Pickaxe Public Library, and the possibility of their marriage was widely discussed in the community. Both preferred their individual lifestyles, however, and let it be known that their cats were incompatible. Riker said, Why don't you come and have dinner with us tonight? The Comptons will be there, and Mildred is doing her famous coddled pork chops. What time? About seven. What do you think about the Fishport mystery? Have you heard the rumor about the Hawleys? Yes, and I won't dignify it with a comment. Personally, Riker said, I think it's all a publicity stunt, trumped up by the Chamber of Commerce, to promote tourism. Quillerin could never leave downtown without stopping at the used bookstore. He collected pre-owned classics, as others in his financial bracket collected Van Gogh's. Currently, he was interested in Mark Twain. Coming from bright sunlight into the gloomy shop, he saw dimly. There was movement on a tabletop. That was Winston, the dust-colored long hair flicking his tail over the biographies. There were sounds in the back room and the aroma of frying bacon. That was Eddington Smith preparing his lunch. A bell had tinkled on the door and the old gray bookseller came out eagerly to meet a customer. Mr. Q, I've found three more for you, all with good bindings. Connecticut Yankee, a horse's tail, and jumping frog. Mark Twain lectured up here once, my father told me, so his books were popular. Two or three show up in every estate liquidation. Well, keep your eyes peeled for the titles I wanted. I'm going on vacation for a few weeks. Do you have plenty to read? I know you like Thomas Hardy, and I just found a leather-bound edition of Far From the Maddy Crowd. My father used that expression often, and I never knew that he got it from Thomas Hardy. Or Thomas Gray, Quillerin corrected him. Gray said it first, in elegy written in a country churchyard. I didn't know that, said Eddington, always glad to learn a new fact. I'll tell my father tonight when I talk to him. Then he added in response to a questioning glance, I talk to him every night and tell him the events of the day. How long has he been gone? Quillerin asked. He died peacefully in his sleep, 14 years ago next month. We were in the book business together for almost 40 years. A rare privilege. Quillerin had never known his own father. He bought the Thomas Hardy book as well as the others and was leaving the store with his purchases when the bookseller called after him, Where are you going on vacation, Mr. Q? Just up to Mooseville. That's nice. You'll see some flying saucers. Quillerin bristled at the suggestion, but said a polite maybe. Both he and Arch Riker, professional skeptics, scoffed at the UFO gossip in Mooseville. The Chamber of Commerce encouraged it, hoping for an incident that would make the town the Roswell of the North. Tourists were excited at the prospect of seeing aliens. Friendly locals referred to them as visitors. Others blamed them for every quirk of weather or outbreak of sheep fly. Quillerin, to his dismay, had found several believers in the interplanetary origin of UFOs, among such persons as Riker's wife, the superintendent of schools, and a sophisticated young heiress from Chicago. Or else, they were play-acting to preserve a local tradition, like adults pretending to believe in Santa Claus. The last stop on his morning round was Amanda's design studio, where Fran Brody, second in command, was back from vacation. She was one of the most attractive young women in Pickaxe, as well as one of the most talented. And now she had the added glamour that seems to come with foreign travel. He said, I don't need to ask if you had a good time. You look spectacularly happy. It was fabulous, she cried, tossing her strawberry blonde hair. Have you been to Italy? only as a foreign correspondent for papers down below. You must go there for a vacation and take Polly. The cities, the countryside, the art, the food, the people. She rolled her eyes in a way that suggested she was not telling the whole story about the people. Sit down, Quill. We have things to discuss. 
She had done a small design job for him and was redesigning the interior of the Pickaxe Hotel, but her greatest passion was the Pickaxe Theater Club. It had been her idea to do summer theater in a bar near Mooseville. They were opening with a comedy, Visitor to a Small Planet. Are you going to review our opening night, Will? I'm afraid so. For the first time in club history, we're getting reviewers from neighboring counties, the Lockmaster Ledger and Bixby Bugle. Do you know the play? Only that Gore Vidal wrote it, and it opened on Broadway a long time ago. It's a fun production, Fran said. A flying saucer lands in front of a TV commentator's house, and a visitor from outer space proceeds to stir things up. Who's paying the visitor? Were you able to draw from a pool of small green actors? That's our big joke, Quill. We've purposely cast actors under five feet nine for all the Earthlings, so the visitor comes as a shock. He's six feet eight. Derek Cuddlebrick. Isn't that a hoot? Larry's playing the commentator, and Scott Gipple is perfect for the overbearing general. Shall I have two tickets at the box office for you on Friday? One will do, Quillerin said. Polly's vacationing with her sister in Ontario. They're seeing Shakespeare in Stratford and some Shaw plays at Niagara on the Lake. Oh, I'm envious, Fran cried. Don't be greedy. You've just seen the Pope in Rome, David in Florence, and all those virile gondoliers in Venice. She gave him a Fran Brody glance, half amusement, half rebuke. Where did you find a barn suitable for a theater? He asked. Avery Botts is letting us use his dairy barn for nine weekends. Each play will run three weekends. I see, said Quillerin thoughtfully. And what will the cows do on weekends? Are you serious, Quill? Avery quit dairy farming a long time ago when the state built the prison. They gave him a lot of money for his back 40, and he switched to poultry. You must have seen his place on Lakeshore just west of Pickaxe Road. Big white frame farmhouse with a lot of white outbuildings. A sign on the lawn says, Fresh Eggs, Friars. Avery tells a funny story about that. Want to hear it? Is it clean? Well, one summer day, she began, a city dude and a flashy blonde drove into the farmyard in a convertible with the top down. The guy yelled that he wanted a dozen friars. Avery told him he had only three on hand, but could have the other nine in a couple of hours. The guy slammed into reverse and yelled, Forget it. Sell your three eggs to somebody else. And he gunned the car back down the drive in a cloud of dust. When Avery tells the story, he laughs till he chokes. I don't get it, Quillerin admitted, but I'm a city dude myself. A friar, Quill, is a young chicken, not an egg that you fry. Hmm, learn something every day. We're going to call our theater the Friars Club Summer Stage, but I'm doing all the talking. She said, what's your news? Only that the cats and I are moving to the beach for a month. Have you seen your new guest house? Not yet. I hope you didn't make it too comfortable or too attractive. I don't want to find myself in the motel business. Don't worry, I did it in bilious colors with lumpy mattresses, flimsy towels, and framed pictures of drowning sailors. Good, he said. See you Friday night. Break a leg. Driving back to the barn to collect the Siamese for the Mooseful expedition, Quillerin considered what he would need to pack in his van. For himself, it would be, first of all, the automated coffee maker. Otherwise, he would require only polo shirts, shorts and sandals, plus writing materials and a few books. There was no point in taking the revolutionary high-tech recumbent bike that had been presented to him by the community as a token of their esteem. The rider reclined in a bucket seat, pedaling with elevated feet. Needless to say, it was such a sensation in pickaxe that he seldom ventured out on the highway. Instead, he displayed it in his living room as a conversation piece and even an art object. On this occasion, he decided to leave it where it was. After all, there was a trail bike in the tool shed at the cabin. The cat's vacation needs were more complex. He would have to take their blue cushion from the top of the refrigerator, the turkey roaster that served as their commode, several bags of their favorite cat litter that was kind to the toes, grooming equipment, their special dishes for food and water, a month's supply of kabibbles, a crunchy treat prepared by a neighbor, and a few cans of their preferred brands of red salmon, crab meat, 
lobster and smoked turkey. Right now it was time for their midday snack, and they would be waiting for him, prancing on long, thin legs, waving eloquent tails, raising eager eyes that were pools of blue in their brown masks. When he unlocked the door, however, both were asleep on the sofa. A tangle of pale fawn fur and brown legs and tails, with heads buried in each other's underside, except for three visible ears. Treat, he said in a stage whisper. Two heads popped up. Yow! Came Coco's clamoring response. Now! Shrieked Yum Yum. After the luggage was packed and the van loaded. And after Yum Yum had been chased and captured and pushed into the cat carrier, Coco was found sitting in the bucket seat of the recumbent bike, looking wise. Oh well, Quillerin thought, I might as well take it along. I can practice on the back road. Chapter Two. The two passengers in the cat carrier on the back seat complained and jockeyed for position, then settled down as the brown van picked up speed on the open highway. The route to Mooseville lay due north. For Quillerin, it was a highway of memories crowded with landmarks from his earlier experiences in the county. Dinsdale Diner, bad coffee, good gossip. Itabidiwasi Road, turn left to Shantytown, right to the Buckshot Mine. Old Turkey Farm, once owned by Mildred Riker's first husband. Abandoned cemetery, poison ivy. State prison, famous flower gardens, infamous scandal. At the prison gates, the dozing Siamese perked up, stretched their necks, and sniffed. It was not roses they smelled; it was the lake, still a mile away. They detected open water, aquatic weeds, algae, plankton, minnows. Their excitement increased as the van traveled along the lakeshore road. On the left, Quillerin saw Avery Botts's farmhouse and the Friars Club summer stage. On the right, glimpses of the lake between the trees. On the left, pasture land with cattle ruminating or horses showing off their glossy coats and noble bearing. On the right, the rustic gate of top of the Dunes Club where the Rikers had their beach house. On the left, a solitary stone chimney, all that remained of an old one-room schoolhouse. On the right, the letter K on a post. This was the old Clingan Chain property, a half-square mile of ancient forest on ancient sand dunes, with a sandy drive winding among pines, oaks, maples, and cherry trees. After dipping up and down aimlessly, it emerged in a clearing where a cabin overlooked a hundred miles of water. Built of full round logs interlocking at the corners, the small cabin seemed anchored to the ground by its enormous stone chimney. Eighty-foot pine trees with only a few branches at the top surrounded it like sentinels. Before bringing the cats indoors, Quillerin inspected the premises, which had been cleaned and summarized by a youthful maintenance crew called the Sand Giants Gnomes. The interior space was limited. A single large room with two cubicles at one end and a stone fireplace spanning the other. What suggested spaciousness and a kind of grandeur was the open ceiling that soared to the peak of the roof and was crisscrossed by log beams and braces. As soon as blinds were opened, the large window facing the lake and the three new skylights in the roof filled the interior with shafts of light. Only then was the carrier brought indoors. Its occupants jostling roughly and yowling loudly. The tiny door was unlatched, and suddenly they were quiet and wary. It's safe, Quillerin reassured them. No lions or tigers. The floor has been cleaned and polished, and you can walk on it with impunity. The more you talk to cats, he believed, the smarter they become. Immediately, they remembered the back porch with its concrete floor warmed by the sun's rays. They rushed out to curl and uncurl on its rough surface. Then Coco stretched out to his full length, the better to absorb warmth in every glistening cat hair. Quillerin thought, "He loves the sun, and the sun loves him." He was quoting another journalist, Christopher Smart, who had written a poem about his cat Jeffrey. 
It was rich in quotable lines, even though Christopher and Geoffrey had lived in the 18th century. While the Siamese lounged al fresco, Quillerin unpacked the van. First, the recumbent bicycle. The tough old trail bike was in the tool shed, but the snooty technological freak with basket seat and elevated pedals deserved more respect. He parked it on the kitchen porch. Trial runs on the back roads of pickaxe had convinced him that it was safer, speedier, and less tiring than conventional bikes. Whether he would have the nerve to ride such a curiosity in tradition-bound Mooseville was yet to be decided. Other baggage from the van made itself at home. Clothing in the sleeping cubicle, writing materials in the office cubicle, books on shelves in the main room. Two exceptions went on the coffee table. The Thomas Hardy novel because of its impressive leather binding, and Mark Twain A to Z because of its large size. Coco liked to sit on large books. There was a second screened porch on the lakeside with a magnificent view and plenty of afternoon sun, but the concrete floor was not good for rolling the Siamese had discovered. Sand tracked in from the beach or was blown in by prevailing winds. The cabin perched on a lofty sand dune that had been hundreds of years in the making, its steep slope anchored by beach grass and milkweed. A sand ladder led down to the beach. It was simply a framework of two-by-fours filled in with loose sand for trash. Quillerin, dressed for dinner in white shorts and black polo shirt, stood at the top of the sand ladder and noticed that the beach had changed. Normally an expanse of deep, dry sand, it was now a hard, flat, pebbly surface, while the loose sand had blown up into a ridge at the foot of the dune. It might blow away or wash away in the next storm. That was the fascination of living at the shore. The water itself could change from calm to turbulent in five minutes, while its color shifted from blue to turquoise to green. He walked along the shore to the Rikers Beach House. The first half mile bordered his own property and included the stony Seagull Point. Then came the row of cottages known as Top of the Dune Club. This year they had been given names displayed on rustic signs of routed wood. The golfing Mableys called their place the Sand Trap. The old Dunfield cottage, said to be haunted, was now Little Manderley. A little frame house called the Little Frame House was understandable when one knew the owners had a picture framing business. Then there was Bah Humbug, which could belong only to the Comptons. Lyle was superintendent of schools, a grouch with a sense of humor. Most of the cottagers were on their decks, and they waved at Quillerin. Some invited him up for a drink. Last in the row was the Rikers Cottage, a yellow frame bungalow called Sunny Days, D-A-Z-E. Is that the cleverest name you could think of? Quillerin asked Arch, never missing a chance to needle his old friend. Arch was serving drinks. Mildred was serving cannabis. The Comptons were there, and Toulouse sat on the deck railing, a silent bundle of black and white fur. Does he ever say anything? Quillerin asked, comparing his silence with Coco's electronic yowl. He says a polite meow when I feed him, Mildred said. For a stray, he's very well mannered. She was wearing a caftan intended to disguise her plumpness. Her husband's leisure garb did nothing to camouflage his well-fed silhouette, but he was happy and relaxed. By comparison, the superintendent of schools looked underfed and overworked after three decades of coping with school boards, teachers, and parents. Lisa Compton was as pleasant as her husband pretended to be grouchy. Mildred announced, Quill has built a guest house. Expecting a lot of company? Lisa asked. No, it's strictly for emergency overnights, he said. It's a little larger than a dollhouse and a little more comfortable than a tent. I come up here to get away from it all and don't encourage guests. Lisa asked about Polly Duncan. They were usually seen together at dinner parties. She's traveling in Canada with her sister during July. A whole month? You'll miss her, Mildred said. He shrugged. She went to England for a whole summer and I survived. The truth was, already he missed their nightly phone calls and he would miss their weekends even more. Has anyone tried the new restaurant? 
No one had, but they had read about it on the food page of the something. A couple had come from Florida to run it during the summer months. The wife was the chef with a bachelor's degree from a culinary institute. It sounded promising. Mildred said, we stressed her training because MCCC will soon have a chef's school and we knew our readers would be curious about the curriculum in a school like that. It was a generous feature, but the chef's husband had the bad taste to phone and complain because we didn't price the entrees or list the desserts. Lisa nodded wisely. He was jealous because his wife got all the attention and he wasn't even in the photo. Then they discussed the backpacker mystery. No conclusion. The sand giants gnomes, nice kids. The sudden naming of beach houses, someone's nephew was in the sign business. Quilleran asked Lyle, what's new with the school system? Any conspiracies? Any bloodshed? I'll tell you what's happening, Lyle said crisply. The K Fund has been so generous with our schools that we've gone from the lowest per student expenditure to the highest in the state. So our share of state funding has been reduced to peanuts. At the same time, they're telling us what and how to teach. And if we don't comply, Lisa put in, they're threatening to take over our schools. Over my dead body, Lyle said. Our school system will go private. The whole county will secede from the state, the Principality of Moose, 400 miles north of everywhere, with our own government, our own tax laws, our own education system. And my husband as reigning monarch, Lisa cried, King Lyle I. Thank you, he said. Quill can be Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Arch can be Master of the Royal Cellar. I'll drink to that, said the host as he uncorked another bottle. While he served, Lisa asked Quillerin about his vacation plans, and Lyle asked if he had brought his weird bicycle. If you refer to the recumbent, yes, I brought it, but I plan to ride only on back roads. Mooseville isn't ready for state-of-the-art technology. And what do you intend to read? Mildred asked. Chiefly old editions of Mark Twain that Eddington Smith has found in estate sales. It's amazing how bookish previous generations were in this remote corner of the country. There was no electronic entertainment, Lyle said. Also, there was a lot of affluence in the 19th century, and an impressive library gave the family status. Whether or not they read the books, probably not. I imagine you run across many uncut pages, Quill. Yes, but not in Mark Twain's books. They're all well thumbed. He came through here on a lecture tour, Lisa said. My great-grandmother had a crush on him. She fell for his mustache. I have her diary. The pages are brown and the ink is fading, but it's full of fascinating stuff. Quillerin made a mental note for the quill pen. Lisa Compton's great-grandmother's diary. When Mildred invited them indoors to the table and they were spooning butternut and roasted pepper soup, she asked, Is everyone going to the Friars Club play? It may be Fran Brody's last production. I hear she's had a good job offer in Chicago. She was there for two weeks working on the hotel do-over. Bad news, Lisa moaned. What can we do to keep her here? Get Dr. Prelegate to propose marriage. They've been seeing a lot of each other. Arch said, It'll take more than a college president to keep Fran down on the farm. Get Quiller in to propose. Arch, honey, would you pour the wine? I'm ready to serve the chops, Mildred interrupted. With the coddled chops were twice-baked potatoes, a broccoli souffle, a pinot noir, and a toast from Lyle Compton. Thursday's Independence Day. Let's drink to the genius who single-handedly dragged the 4th of July parade from the pits and launched it to the stars. Hear, hear, the others shouted with vigor. Mildred blushed. Lie. I didn't know you could be so poetic. Speech, speech. Well, our parades were getting to be all commercial and political. The last straw was a candy-grabbing free-for-all for kids with rock music blaring from a sound truck and not an American flag in sight. Someone had to put a foot down, and I have big feet. That's my wife, Arch said proudly. This year's parade will have flags, marching bands, floats, grassroots participation, and a little originality. 
athletes from Mooseland High wearing their uniforms will march in four rows of five each carrying banners with a single letter of the alphabet. Each row will spell a word. Peace, truth, honor, and trust. Very clever, said Lisa. Who's the Grand Marshal? Andrew Brody in Scottish regalia with his bagpipe. He'll march just ahead of the color guard and play patriotic tunes in slow tempo. Maybe it's because I was born a Campbell, Lisa said, but there's something about bagpipe music that makes me limp with emotion. The floats will be sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, parent teachers, commercial fisheries, private marinas, and the Friends of Wool. Mildred referred to a new coalition of wool growers, spinners, knitters, and other fiber artists. Barb Ogilvy is our mentor, very talented. She teaches knitting, started the knitting club, runs a knitting day camp for kids. In high school, she was considered a bit wild, but she settled down. Did Arch tell you he's learning to knit socks? Quilleran turned to his lifelong friend in astonishment. Arch, why were you keeping this dirty little secret from me? What the heck, it's one of the things you do when you're middle-aged and in love. Lyle never says sweet things like that, Lisa complained. There was a moment of silence, which Quillerin interrupted by asking, What are the friends of wool going to do on a float? We'll have live sheep, a shepherd playing a flute, two spinners spinning and six knitters knitting, four women and two men, if Arch will consent. Dr. Emerson, the surgeon, has agreed, and I think it would add prestige if the publisher of the newspaper were on the float knitting a sock with four needles. As all eyes turned to him, he said, To quote Shakespeare, I don't wanna, I don't have to, and I ain't gonna. His wife smiled knowingly at the others. After an old-fashioned Waldorf salad and black forest cake and coffee, Lyle wanted to smoke a cigar, and the other two men accompanied him down the sand ladder to the beach. Their first comment was about the miniature sand dune recently formed. It extended at least a mile to everyone's knowledge. Someday, Lyle predicted, it will be 30 feet high and our cottages will have crumbled to dust, leaving only the stone chimneys. Tour groups from other planets will gawk at these monuments as tour guides explain that they had religious significance, being used to ensure fertility and ward off famine. Quillerin skipped a few stones across the placid lake surface. You're good at that, Arch said. That's something I could never learn to do. It's one of my few talents. I could never learn to knit a sock. Lyle said, You should ride on the float, Arch. I'm going to be on the PTA float. We're reproducing a one-room school with old desks and blackboards, a pot-bellied stove, and everyone in 19th century costume. I'm going to be the principal in a frock coat and pince-nez eyeglasses, brandishing a whipping cane. I expect to get booed by the parade watchers. I just hope they don't throw eggs. He finished his cigar, and they climbed the sand ladder to the deck, where the two women were giggling suspiciously. Mildred said, Quill, I'd like to ask you a great favor. It would be a privilege and a pleasure. He could never say no to Mildred. She was so sincere, generous, and good-natured, and she was such a good cook. Well, the parade opens with a 1776 tableau on a float, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and it ends with a flock of bicycles. Wouldn't it be a terrific finale if you brought up the rear with your high-tech recumbent bike? Quillerin hesitated only a second. I'm not too enthusiastic about the idea, but I'll pedal with my feet up in the air if Arch will ride on your float knitting a sock. Chapter 3 Ordinarily, Coco was a feline alarm clock at 11 p.m., reminding the world at large that it was time for a bedtime snack and lights out, so his behavior on his first night at the cabin made Quillerin wonder. The three of them had been lolling on the screened porch in the dark, watching the fireflies blink their little flashlights. The porch was furnished with cushioned chairs and a dining set in weatherproof molded resin, white at Fran Brody's suggestion, as a foil for the dark logs. 
While Kullerin and Yum Yum enjoyed the luxury of cushions, Coco huddled on the dining table, perhaps because it gave him an elevated view of the dark beachfront. Eventually, Yum Yum became restless, leading Quillerin to consult his watch and announce, Treat! She scampered after him when he went indoors to serve the kabibbles, but Coco stayed where he was. Something's down there, Quillerin realized, something I can't see. It was a clear night. The stars were bright, the crickets were chirping. Somewhere an owl was hooting, and a gentle surf splashed rhythmically on the shore. It was a pleasant night, too, with no chill in the air, so Quillerin left the door to the porch open when he retired to his sleeping cubicle. Coco could come indoors if the scene became boring. He could join Yum Yum on the blue cushion atop the refrigerator. Quillerin had a dream that night. He always dreamed after eating pork. In his dream, Moose County had seceded from the state and was an independent principality ruled by a royal family, prime minister, cabinet, and national council. But they were all cats. There was nothing original about the scenario. He had been reading a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, in which a character suggested feline rule as an improvement over the existing system. In Quillerin's dream, the royal cat family was shown to be intelligent, entertaining, and inexpensive to maintain. He was sorry to wake up. He found Coco none the worse for his nocturnal escapade. He ate a good breakfast and then wanted to go for a ride on Quillerin's shoulder. He kept jumping at the latch on the screen door of the porch. Not now, Quillerin told him. Later. You've had your breakfast and now I'm entitled to mine. This is a democratic family. You're not the ruling monarch. Before setting off for Mooseville in his van, Quillerin inspected his new guest accommodation. First, he had to find it, hidden in the woods, the same size as the tool shed and built of the same green-stained cedar. But the snuggery had windows and indoor plumbing. Modular furniture, including a double-deck bunk, made the utmost use of every inch of space. Red blankets, a red rug, and a framed picture of poppies were a trifle overpowering in the small quarters, but cheerful, Quillerin thought. It's not a bad place to stay overnight, but I wouldn't want to stay two nights. Fran knew what she was doing. From there, he drove along the lakeshore to Mooseville, a quaint resort town two miles long and hardly more than a block wide. It was squeezed between the lake and a high wall of sand called the Great Dune. On the lakeside of Main Street were the municipal docks, private marinas, bait shops, and the Northern Lights Hotel. On the other side, the bank, post office, hardware store, shipwreck tavern, and so on. A few side streets with names like Oak, Pine, and Maple dead-ended at the foot of the Great Dune and were lined with shops, offices, small eateries, and the shipwreck museum. The Great Dune, which had taken an estimated 10,000 years to form, was held in reverence in Mooseville. It rose abruptly and towered protectively over the downtown area, crowned with a lush forest of trees. There were no structures up there. Even if building were permitted, who would dare? The sheer drop of about a hundred feet was formidable and famous. It could be seen for miles out in the lake. Only one thoroughfare sliced through the Great Dune, and that was Sand Pit Road at the east end of downtown. It was a reminder that sand had once been mined and exported to bolster the country's failing economy. A chunk of the Great Dune had been shipped down below for the construction of concrete highways, bridges, and skyscrapers, like a little bit of Moose County and cities all over the northeast central United States. On the first day of Quillerin's vacation, he always made the rounds, renewing his acquaintance with business people, asking about their winter doings and summer prospects. It was neighborly and also good public relations for the newspaper. On this morning, he had breakfast at the hotel and shook hands with the owners. He shook hands with the bank manager and cashed a check. He shook hands with a postmaster and told her he expected to receive mail addressed to general delivery. Three postcards had already arrived. 
At Gratz Grocery, he shook hands with the whole family and bought some boiled ham for sandwiches. He shook hands with the druggist and stocked up on hard and soft beverages for possible guests. At the shipwreck tavern, he shook hands with the bartender. Still drinking squunk water? The man asked. Have one on the house. I believe in supporting local products, Quillerin said. It was a mineral water from a spring in squunk corners. Expecting a lot of business tomorrow? Nah, parades are family days, not much serious drinking. Any developments in the case of the missing backpacker? Nah, I say it's a lot of hokum. Like the two-headed raccoon a couple of years back gives folks something to talk about. Next, Quillerin went to Huggins Hardware for mosquito repellent and shook hands with Cecil Huggins and his great uncle, a white-bearded man who had worked in the store since the age of 12. Mosquitoes not so bad this year, are they, Unc? Nope, said the old man. Weather's too dry. The store had a carefully cultivated old-time country store atmosphere that appealed to vacationers from down below. Rough wood floors, old showcases, and such merchandise as pitchforks, kerosene lanterns, 50-pound salt blocks, goat feed, and nails by the pound. What can you tell me about the new restaurant? Quillerin asked. On Sandpit Road, across from the Great Dune Motel, Cecil replied. Same building where the Chinese restaurant opened and closed last summer. A couple came up from Florida to run it for the tourist season. The Chamber of Commerce ran an ad in Florida Papers, Business Opportunity with Special Perks. The guy's name is Owen Bowen. His wife's the chef. Food's too fancy, said the old man. Perhaps for campers and locals, Cecil admitted. But the whole idea is to get summer people from the Grand Island Club to come here on their yachts and spend money. What were the special perks? Pretty generous, we thought. The landlord gave him a break on the rent. The Northern Lights Hotel gave him a suite for the price of a single. Chamber members pitched in and redecorated the restaurant before the Bowens got here. Twirl red last year, said Unc. Yes, we painted the walls, cleaned the kitchen, washed the windows. You'd think he'd be tickled pink, wouldn't you? But no. He came to a chamber meeting, belly aching about this, that, and the other thing. Then he wanted us to change the name of the Great Dune to the White Cliffs. He said it was more glamorous, more promotable. He talked down to us as if we were a bunch of hicks. And how did that suggestion go over? Quillerin asked. Like a lead balloon. Everybody knows a cliff is rock. Our dune is pure sand. Cliffs are a dime a dozen. But where can you find a dune like ours? We voted against the idea unanimously, and he stomped out of the meeting like a spoiled kid. If he ain't careful, the old man said with a chuckle, he'll get the sand giant riled up. Quillerin said he hoped the food was better than Owen's personality. Have you tried it? Not yet, but they say it's good. They say his wife's nice. Too bad Owen turned out to be disagreeable. He's a horse's tail, said Unc. One more thing, Quillerin mentioned. I have a screen door with a rat tail latch that gets stuck. The bar doesn't drop. I'm afraid the cats could push the door open. Easy, said Cecil, and sold him a can of spray lubricant. After the formal handshaking, Quillerin ambled over to Elizabeth Hart's boutique on Oak Street at the foot of the Great Dune. Having saved her life once upon a time, he felt a godfatherly interest in her well-being. She had belonged to the Grand Island set, and there was something subtly different in her grooming, clothing, speech, manner, and ideas. A Chicago heiress, she had visited Moose County, met Derek Cuttlebrink, and decided to stay. They were good for each other. He had toned down her citified pretensions without spoiling her individuality. She had convinced him to enroll in restaurant management at Moose County Community College, and it was Derek who had renamed her boutique. It was now called Elizabeth's Magic. Unlike the surrounding souvenir shops, it featured exotic wearables, crafts by local artisans, and such mystic paraphernalia as tarot cards, rune stones, Ouija boards, and good luck jewelry. There was also a coffee dispenser in the rear of the shop and a ring of chairs in aluminum and black nylon. When Quillerin walked in, Elizabeth was busy with customers but waved an airy greeting and said, Don't go away, I have news for you. For a few minutes he joined the browsers, then gravitated toward the coffee dispensary. 
After a while, Elizabeth joined him, leaving a husky male assistant to keep an eye on idle sightseers and take the money of paying customers. Quillerin asked, Is your shop sponsoring a football team or is he a bouncer? He was one of the big blonde youths indigenous to the North Country. That's Kenneth, a rising senior at Mooseland High, she said. He's my stock boy and delivery man, and I'm breaking him in on sales. Are you going to the parade tomorrow, Quill? I designed the Chamber of Commerce float, the signing of the Declaration of Independence based on the John Turnbull painting. I know it, Quillerin said. It's in Philadelphia. Who'll play the roles of the signers? CFC members, all in 1776 costumes, wigs, knee breeches, satin waistcoats, jabots, buckle shoes. We're renting everything from a theater supply house in Chicago. That's a big investment, Quillerin said. Who's paying? You, she said with glee. Well, not exactly you, but the K Fund. We applied for a grant. Is Derek going to be in the parade? No, the play at the barn opens Friday and he has the title role. He's concentrating on that. But the big news is that he has a job. Assistant manager at the new restaurant. They have a sophisticated menu and a good wine list, so he hopes he'll learn something. Have you met Owen Bowen? Only at a CFC meeting. He's middle-aged, quite handsome, rather supercilious, and ever so tan, she said disdainfully. I consider him a bit of a pill, but Derek can handle it. I believe it. Derek's height, six feet eight, coupled with his swaggering but likable personality, appealed to young girls, bosses, grandmothers, and cats and dogs. Elizabeth said, It was Derek who named the new restaurant. The psychology of naming food establishments is something he learned at MCCC. Mr. Bowen planned to name it, Ugh, the Cliffside Cafe. Derek told him it was too ordinary. Owen's place has an element of played-down snob appeal that will attract the yachting crowd from Grand Island. At this point, she was called to the front of the store, and Quillerin looked at a sailboat in the craft display. It was handcrafted entirely of copper, labeled Sloop Rigged with Topsail, Mainsail, Jib Sail, and Spinnaker by Miles Zander. He was a commercial fisherman whose hobby was metalwork. Does the pedestal go with it? Quillerin asked Kenneth. I don't know, but the guide'd sell it to you, I bet. It weighs a ton. I'll deliver it if you want. When Quillerin drove away, he had bought a copper sculpture and a railroad tie. He had always liked sailboats, although he had never learned the difference between a sloop, a yawl, and a catch. He bought yachting magazines and read about the cup races, and the sight of a sailboat regatta breezing along the horizon quickened his pulse. Now he could tell Archie had bought a sailboat and would watch his old friend's jaw drop. Before going home, he drove out to Fishport to see Doris Hawley for several reasons. Beyond the Mooseville town limits, he passed a former canning factory that had once supplied half the nation with smoked herring. Now it housed an animal clinic, a video store, and a coin-operated laundry. Farther along the highway, the Foo restaurant had not yet replaced the letter D that blew off its sign in a northern hurricane two decades ago. Next came the fisheries, a complex of weathered sheds and wharves. They were silent as death when the fleet was out, but a scene of manic activity when the catch came in. Beyond the Roaring Creek Bridge, on the left, was the trailer home of Magnus and Doris Hawley. A homemade sign on the lawn, a square of plywood nailed to a post, said, Home Bakes. That meant muffins, cinnamon rolls, and cookies. Mrs. Hawley was watering the extensive flower garden when Quillerin pulled into the side drive. Beautiful garden, Mrs. Hawley, he called out. You must have two green thumbs. Oh, hello, Mr. Q. She turned off the spray and dropped the nozzle. It's been awfully dry. Don't know when I saw such a stretch without rain. What can I do for you? Do you happen to have any cinnamon rolls? Half pan or whole pan? They freeze nicely. Hush, she said to a barking terrier who ran excitedly back and forth on his trolley. She was a gray-haired woman with a gardener's slight stoop and the energy of a much younger person. When she went into the house, Quillerin looked toward the rear of the property and saw a picnic bench on a grassy bank, but the dry spell had tamed the roaring creek to a gurgle. Is Magnus working the boats today? He asked when she returned. 
Oh, you can't keep that man off the boats, she said with pride as well as disapproval. He's 70 and could retire, but what would he do? Winters are bad enough. He does a little ice fishing, but watches an awful lot of television. And how do you cope with a fishport winter? Well, I don't have any garden or any customers for home bakes, so I read books and write letters to our sons down below. If you don't mind a suggestion, Quillerin said, why don't you get into the literacy program and teach adults how to read? Pickaxe has an active program, and I imagine this community could use one. Mrs. Hawley was aghast. I wouldn't know how to do that. I don't think I could. They'd give you a training course and tutoring. Think it over. Meanwhile, have you heard anything about the young man you befriended? Not a thing. The police were here twice, asking questions. We've told them everything we know. They act as if we're holding something back. It makes me nervous. And some nasty people are saying my cookies were poisoned. I haven't sold a one since that rumor started. I worry about the whole thing. You have nothing to worry about, Mrs. Hawley. The nasty people will choke on their own lives. As for the police, they're trained to investigate in certain ways. I'm sorry your act of kindness boomeranged. You're very kind, Mr. Q. I'll tell Magnus what you said. By the way, do you know someone named Mike Xander? Why, yes, he's on the boats. They go to our church. His wife just had a beautiful baby boy. Did you know he's quite an artist? I've purchased one of his sculptures. That's nice. They can use the money. I'd heard that he putters around with metal in his spare time. Are you going to the parade tomorrow, Mr. Q? Magnus will be on the float sponsored by the fisheries. I can't tell you anything about it because it's kind of a secret joke. Those fishermen are great jokers when they get their heads together, Quillerin said. Four generations of our family will be on the sidelines, including my widowed mother-in-law, who's a great fan of yours, Mr. Q. She's embroidering a sampler for you. That's thoughtful of her. He mustered as much enthusiasm as he could. What's a sampler? A motto that you can frame and hang on the wall. Devoted readers liked to send him useless knickknacks made by their own loving hands, and it was to his credit that he always sent a handwritten thank you. During his boyhood, he had written countless thank you letters to his mother's friends who sent him toys and books that were three years too young for him. His mother always said, Jamie, we accept gifts in the spirit in which they were given. To Mrs. Hawley, he said, Well, well, a sampler. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? This ends Disc 1, The Cat Who Saw Stars. Disc 2. Driving home. Quillerin wondered what a fisherman's widow would choose to embroider for. Home sweet home? Love one another? He had seen these words of wisdom in antique shops, worked with thousands of stitches and framed in tarnished gilt. He had never seen slide Kelly slide or nice guys finish last, or his mother's favorite maxim, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. Growing up in a one-parent household, he had heard that advice a thousand times. Instead of turning him into an optimist, however, it had made him a donut addict. What he really liked was the traditional fried cake with cake-like texture and crisp brown crust redolent of hot cooking oil. As he drove, he watched automatically for the old schoolhouse chimney, then turned left into the long K drive. Halfway up the twisting dirt lane, he could hear Coco yowling. The cat knew he was coming. The noisy welcome could mean that the phone had been ringing, or something had been knocked down and smashed, or the radio had been left on, or there was a plumbing leak. Cool it, old boy, nothing's wrong, Quillerin said after inspecting the premises, but Coco continued to frisk about. When he jumped up at the peg where his harness hung, the message was clear. He wanted to go for a walk. Quillerin obliged and recorded the cat's antics in his personal journal. It was not a real diary, just a spiral notebook in which he described noteworthy moments in his life. This was one of them. The report was headed, Mooseville, Wednesday, July 3rd. Coco did it again. He solved a mystery that was boggling the gossips around here. Nobody but me will ever know. 
If the media discovered this cat's psychic tendencies, they'd give us no peace. What happened? Coco wanted to go for a walk on the beach, meaning that I walk and he rides on my shoulder. That way he doesn't bog down in deep sand or cut his precious toes on sharp pebbles. Smart cat. He wears a harness and I keep a firm hand on the leash. All day long he'd wanted to explore the beach. Finally we buckled up and went down the sand ladder. I started to walk west toward town, but Coco made a royal ruckus. He wanted to go east, toward Seagull Point, I imagined. But we hadn't gone far before a strange growl came from the cat's innards and his body stiffened. Then, impulsively, he wanted to get down on the sand. Keeping a taut leash, I let him go. Well, to watch him struggle through that deep sand would have been comic if it weren't that he was dead serious. When he reached the sand ridge, he climbed up the slope, slipping and sliding. I was tempted to give him a boost, but didn't. This whole expedition was his idea. By the time he reached the top, he was really growling, and he started to dig. Sand flew, but most of it trickled back into the excavation. Coco wouldn't give up. Though. What was he after? A dead seagull buried in the sand? He dug and he dug, and I started to get suspicious. Look out, I said, pushing him aside. I saw something shining in the hole. The sun was hitting something that glinted. It was the face of a wristwatch. I grabbed Coco and ran back to the cabin. After calling 911, Quillerin gave Coco a treat. It was not long to wait. The sheriff's department knew the K cabin. They checked it regularly during the winter. In a matter of minutes, a patrol car came through the woods, and a deputy in a wide-brimmed hat stepped out. Quillerin went out to meet her, Moose County's first woman deputy. You reported finding a body? She asked impassively. Down on the beach, buried in the sand, I'll show you the way. She followed him down the sand ladder and along the shore to Coco's excavation. How'd you find it? Just walking on the beach. She examined the hole. Looks like some animal's been digging. It seems so, doesn't it? Unhooking her phone, she called the state police post, and Quillerin said he would go back to the cabin and direct whoever responded. In the next half hour, the clearing filled with vehicles. Quillerin met each one and pointed to the sand ladder, otherwise he stayed out of sight. First, the state police car with two officers. Second, the ambulance of the rescue squad. They had shovels and a stretcher. Then, another sheriff's car with two passengers in the back seat. Magnus and Doris Hawley were escorted down the sand ladder by the deputy. Soon, the helicopter from Pickaxe landing on the hard, flat sand near the water. That would be the medical examiner, Quillerin presumed. Unexpectedly, a blue pickup delivering the railroad tie and copper sculpture. Hey, what's going on here? Kenneth asked. A simulated rescue drill. My responsibility is to keep the driveway open, so just drop the stuff and go back down the drive. Hey, this is cool. How old is this cabin? I don't know, Quillerin said. I'll take the sculpture. You take the tie around to the lakeside and put it on the screen porch. I'll lead the way. With some prodding, Kenneth positioned the tie in the northwest corner of the porch. Hey, some view you got here. Yes, this way out. Are those cats? Yes. Come on, Kenneth, this drill is being timed to the split second on the double. Quillerin packed him off down the driveway, just as the deputy escorted the Hawleys up the sand ladder. Quillerin ducked indoors. They drove away. Then the ambulance left. The helicopter lifted off, taking a blue body bag on a stretcher. When the state troopers drove away, only Deputy Greenleaf remained, and Quillerin went out to size her up. Though not bad-looking, she was stony-faced, a mask that seemed to go with the wide-brimmed hats worn by deputies. Glancing at him and getting out her pad, she said, You must be Mr. Q. Yes, but are you aware of the department's policy? We don't release your name. That's right. You must be Deputy Greenleaf. It had said in the paper that a woman deputy was needed to escort women prisoners to the Bixby County Detention Facility. Glad to have you in the department. She nodded, and the tassels on her hat 
barbed. Now Quillerin knew why Coco had stayed up all night. He knew what was on the beach. If he had not campaigned for an outing on the shore, if he had not insisted on going east instead of west, if he had not started digging at one particular spot, the backpacker mystery would remain unsolved. Most cats had a sixth sense, but Coco's perception of right and wrong went beyond catly concerns. He sensed answers to the questions that baffled humans and found ways of communicating his findings. Quillerin could attribute his talents only to his magnificent whiskers. Yum Yum had the standard 48. Coco had 60. Quillerin had reasons for being secretive about Coco's special gifts and his own involvement, and he was relieved to hear the 6 o'clock newscast on WPKX. Acting on a tip from a beachcomber, the sheriff's department today found the body of the backpacker missing since Friday. It was buried in the sand near Mooseville. The deceased was identified by Magnus and Doris Hawley as the hiker who had come to their house asking permission to camp on their property. Cause of death has not been determined, according to a sheriff's spokesperson. Identification was found on the body but is being withheld pending notification of family. The deceased was not from the Tri-County area. The locals always felt better when the subject of an accident or crime was not one of their own. Arch Riker would be furious, Quillerin knew, because the news break had happened on the radio station's time, and the something could not cover it until Friday. No paper was published on the holiday. Quillerin himself was pleased with the way things had turned out and proposed to reward the Siamese with a session of reading aloud. They always enjoyed the sound of his voice, and he rather enjoyed it too. He suggested, far from the madding crowd. You'll like it, he said. It's about sheep and cows. There's also a dog named George and a cat who plays a minor role. His readings for the Siamese were always dramatized by sound effects. His theater training in college had made him an expert at bleating, barking and meowing, if nothing else, and the cats especially liked the lowing of cattle. He did a two-note moo like a foghorn. When he moved, they looked at him with a do-it-again expression in their alert blue eyes, and he did it again. To tell the truth, he enjoyed mooing. After the reading, he unpacked the sailboat that Kenneth had delivered. Yum Yum assisted. She had a vested interest in shiny objects, cardboard boxes, and crumpled paper and the carton was stuffed with crumpled sheets of the Moose County something. The sailboat looked larger than it had in the store among all the other merchandise. A foot tall, it was constructed of sheet copper that had been treated to retain color and brilliance, and it was dazzling in the light from the sky windows. The sails, tilted at realistic angles, played with the light and gave added dimension to the sculpture. To stabilize the lightweight object, there was a heavy base of wood chipped to suggest choppy water with the keel cemented into a groove. It was a clever and eye-catching piece of work. Quillerin carried it to the porch, only to discover that Coco had taken possession of the pedestal where he posed like an ancient Egyptian cat. Jump down, Quillerin said foolishly, knowing that Coco never jumped down when told to jump down. So he left the sailboat on the table and went to write some more in his journal. He had long wanted to keep a journal. Someday he might want to write a memoir. He should have started at an early age, but he had always been too busy growing up, playing baseball, acting in plays, sowing wild oats, discovering the work ethic, hanging around press clubs, and making life-threatening mistakes. Now, at last, he was a journalist with a personal journal. Chapter 4. The 4th of July parade was scheduled to start at 1 p.m., and Quillerin reported early to scout around. Never having participated in a parade, he was curious about the preparations behind the scene. He thought it must be a masterpiece of organization, and it was. 
The staging area was beyond the town limits, with parade units assigned to specific parking lots or open fields. Marchers were close to the starting point, and mechanized units were farthest away. That made sense. In between, assigned to the parking lot of the Fu restaurant, were the bikers. They were a colorful troupe. Quillerin himself wore white shorts, a blue and white striped T-shirt, and a red baseball cap. There were trail bikes, school bikes, plenty of racers, and one old-fashioned high wheeler. He left his recumbent locked in his van and went exploring with a camera hanging about his neck. The floats interested him most. There were five lined up on the highway, flatbeds skirted with tricolor bunting and identifying banners. Signing of the Declaration of Independence, dear old golden school days, friends of war. A 24-foot sailboat on a dolly called Smooth Sailing was sponsored jointly by the private marinas. Its sails furled and its deck awash with young persons in skimpy swimwear. The fifth float was the one Mrs. Hawley had mentioned. It was called Feeding the Chickens. Three commercial fishermen in slickers, boots, and rubber gloves were laughing and clowning as they waited for the signal to move. On the flatbed were a couple of barrels. A weathered table and stacks of wooden boxes. Quillerin signaled to Magnus Hawley, one of the three. Explain the name of your float, he asked. Well, see, soon as we get rolling, we start dressing the fish in the boxes and throwing the guts and heads in the gut barrels. That's when the gulls come out from nowhere. Chickens, we call them. First two or three, then a whole flock following us down the whole route, catching the heads before they hit the barrel. By the time we get to the end, there'll be a hundred. He roared with laughter. Some show. As parade time drew near, the official starter in his tricolored top hat ran up and down the highway, waving his arms and yelling. His aides in tricolor sashes and baseball caps checked the individual units. Standing by was the sheriff's car that would precede the parade at four miles an hour to clear the road and order watchers back onto the sidewalks. Deputy Greenleaf was at the wheel. The color guard stood solemnly at parade rest. The flag bearers flanked by members of the military, rifles by their sides. Highly visible was Andrew Brody, the pickaxe police chief. As Grand Marshal, the Scots bagpiper would lead the parade in full Highland regalia. He was a big man in any uniform, but a giant when swaggering in his lofty feather bonnet, with a shoulder full of plaid and an armful of pipes. There was an air of frenzy around the marching units. However, besides the two bands, there were three restless groups: the Parade of Pets, Parade of Moms, and Athletes for Peace. To add to the confusion, the high school band was practicing, no two musicians playing the same number, while the middle schoolers in the fife and drum corps were warming up and had reached fever pitch. Nervous parents were cautioning children who would trudge the course with cats and dogs on leashes or in wagons. Moms were trying to quiet their youngest, who would ride in strollers, baby buggies, backpacks, or even wheelbarrows. As for the athletes for peace, their staging area was a madhouse. Young persons, each with a large letter of the alphabet on a pole, were running around in a state of hysteria, shouting and laughing like maniacs. They had discovered they could scramble their letters to spell cheat, shoot, treason, and worse. The coach in charge of the unit blew his whistle and yelled at deaf ears. The official starter was frantic. The sheriff's car, the grand marshal, and the color guard were lined up. The first float was pulling up with its serious statesmen in wigs and knee breeches, but the athletes were out of control. What do we do? The starter cried to his aides. Do we cancel him? At that moment, two gunshots sounded above the din. The effect was paralyzing. Everything stopped. No one moved. The silence was heavy with unasked questions. Then the coach blew his whistle. Fall in! The sheriff's car started to roll. After giving it a 50-yard head start, the piper began his slow, swinging gait and skirling rendition of the national anthem. The color guard snapped to attention. No one asked who had fired the shots, but Quillerin had an idea. One by one, the units moved out of the staging area in the correct order, with floats and marchers and bands alternating appropriately. 
Quillerin, waiting for the bikers to be signaled, watched the friends of wool roll past. The shepherd stood knee-deep in a small flock of sheep and baby lambs and played his flute. Two spinners, dressed as pioneer women, sat in antique chairs and treadled their wheels. Six similar chairs were arranged back to back for the knitters, four women and two men. Finally, the parade of bikers was given the signal. The first to take off was the high wheeler, followed by neat rows of bikes pedaled by men and women, girls and boys, in colorful helmets. Bringing up the rear was the most prominent man in the county, reclining in a bucket seat with his feet elevated. Everyone recognized the mustache, and while they applauded, cheered, screamed, and whistled, Quillerin drew on his theater training and peddled with unflappable cool. The onlookers swarmed into the road and followed the recumbent, a pied piper with wheels. Whether their acclaim was for the bike, or the famous mustache, or the man behind the K-Fund, that was anyone's guess. The destaging area of the parade was the high school parking lot on the east side, and when Quillerin arrived, he found a traffic jam. Floats were scattered helter-skelter. Families arrived to pick up their athletes, musicians, moms, pets, and bathing beauties. Two school buses were waiting to transport float personnel back to their vehicles on the west side. A truck from the Ogilvy Sheep Ranch was collecting sheep, spinning wheels, and antique chairs. Quillerin grabbed Mildred's arm just as she was boarding the bus. You got me into this. How about getting me out? What's the problem, Quill? He said, I can't take my bike on the bus. You take my car keys and bring my van down here. It's a brown van in the Foo parking lot. She took his keys. What did you think of our float? The lambs were cute. The shepherd looked like the real thing. The sheep were fat and woolly. But your husband, if I may say so, looked sheepish. I heard that, Hart shouted. I wouldn't even be here if you hadn't blackmailed me, you dirty dog. The bus driver tooted the horn. Come on, folks, they want us to move. Quillerin had invited Andrew Brody to stop at the cabin for a drink following the parade, and the chief had said, Make it at four o'clock. I've got to make an appearance at a backyard barbecue, some relatives in Black Creek. At four o'clock, Quillerin had a beverage tray on the porch along with some gorgonzola and crackers. How was it? he asked when his guest arrived, scowling. All they had to drink was iced tea. I played a tune for them and had a sandwich, then got the heck out. You came to the right place, Andy. I happen to have some single malt scotch and good cheese. Brody was still in Piper's garb, except for the feather bonnet and shoulder plaid. Cocked over one eye was something like a military overseas cap, in navy blue with a red pom-pom, cockade, and two ribbons hanging down the back. It's a Glengarry, he said in response to Quillerin's compliment. He tapped his left temple. It has my clown badge. They went out to the porch where Coco was again on the pedestal and Yum Yum was sniffing insects on the outside of the screen. When Brody sat down, however, she came over to inspect his brogues, bare knees and fancy garters. Then she stood on her hind legs to see what the kilt was all about. She's bewildered, Quillerin explained. Aren't you the visitor who used to wear long pants and a shiny metal badge? Where'd you get the sailboat? Mike Zander made it. He's a commercial fisherman by trade. Sure, I know the Zanders. When I worked for the sheriff, this was my beat. Your guy must be Mike Jr. Whenever I see Mike Sr., we laugh about something that happened a few years back. It was Saturday, and the boats had just come in. Summer people were buying fish on the pier. One stuffy old biddy from down below looked at the fish, some of them still flopping around, and said in an uppity voice, Are you sure they're quite fresh? The crew laughed so hard she left in a huff. Those guys like a laugh, Quillerin said. Their chicken-feeding float had everybody running for cover. We had a good day for the parade, but what we need now is some rain. You have to admit, though, that the dry spell has helped the mosquito situation. I remember one year, the town council brought in colonies of bats to get rid of mosquitoes. They scared off the tourists as well. Quillerin said, let me refresh your drink, Andy. I think I could stand another. Yum Yum followed Quillerin indoors to get a drink of water, and she looked at him so imploringly, he gave her a crumb of gorgonzola. 
When he returned to the porch, Brody was standing at the top of the sand ladder. Your beach is a lot different this year, he said. What's that burnt circle? Some trespassers apparently had a bonfire before I got here, Quillerin said. At least they didn't leave any beer cans, that's to their credit. Brody gave Quillerin a sharp look. I hear you're the one that found the body on the beach. Well, if you must know, yes. He refrained from mentioning Coco's involvement. Brody had heard about that smart cat from a detective down below, but believed only 50% of it, and that reluctantly. Yet both he and the prosecutor valued Quillerin's interest in certain cases and appreciated his tips. They also respected his insistence on anonymity. Brody, for his part, was not above leaking police information if it would aid Quillerin's unofficial investigations. Little by little, a mutual trust had developed between the two men. They sat in silence for a while, no doubt thinking of the same thing, until Quillerin asked, were they able to identify the backpacker? Oh, sure. He had an ID on his person. Philadelphia address, age 25, no next of kin, but the name and phone number of a woman. Homicide or natural causes? Homicide hasn't been ruled out. The coroner can't determine the cause of death. They've flown the body to the state forensic lab. It's strange. Stranger than you think. Everything points to the time of death as midnight last Friday, a few hours after he called at the Holly House, but... Brody paused uncertainly. There was no decomposition. Almost like he was embalmed. He'd been dead four days. I should cut off your drink, Sandy. It's the God's truth. Does anyone have a theory? If they do, they're not talking. The State Bureau has clamped down. This is all between you and me, of course. Of course. And now I've got to take off. Thanks for the refreshments. They walked through the cabin, Brody looking for his Glengarry. I thought I left it on the back of the sofa. They looked behind the sofa cushions and in other places where he may have dropped the cap without thinking. Then Quillerin saw Yum Yum sitting on the dining table looking guilty. She's attracted to small, shiny objects, Andy. She pinched your clan badge. Let me look under the sofa. A few swipes with a fireplace poker produced a brown sock, a yellow pencil, and the missing cap. Quillerin offered to brush it. Don't bother. I'll just give it a couple of whacks. Quillerin walked with him to his car, saying, Remember the two gunshots just before the parade started? Did they ever find out who fired them? Nope. Did they ever try? Nope. It worked, didn't it? How long do you plan to stay here? About a month. We'll keep an eye on your barn. After Brody had driven away, Quillerin came to a decision. Coco would never give up the railroad tie as his pedestal, his perch, his rightful eminence. The sailboat sculpture would have to go on the fireplace mantle. Late that night, the three of them sat on the porch in the dark, Coco gazing at the constellations from his private planetarium. Yum Yum fascinated by the fireflies, Quillerin thinking his thoughts. Brody's remark about the condition of the backpacker's body piqued his curiosity. Tomorrow, he would drive to Fishport to buy some of Mrs. Hawley's home bakes, express his relief that the fate of the young man was known, and find out how she and Magnus felt about identifying the body. Chapter 5 Friday was a gala day in Mooseville, as vacationers and locals looked forward to opening night at the Barn Theatre. Quillerin had promised to review the play and would first have dinner at Owen's place. He wished Polly could be with him. Meanwhile, he had to finish a quill pen column and take it to the bank to be faxed before noon. He found Main Street in the throes of a holiday weekend. Throngs of vacationers sauntered along the sidewalks, looked in shop windows, licked ice cream cones, and were mesmerized by the waterfront. The lake lapping against pilings, boats gently nudging the piers, screaming seagulls catching stale bread crusts on the fly. Next on his schedule was a drive to Fishport. What would Doris Hawley have to say about the grim task of identifying the backpack? As soon as he crossed the Roaring Creek Bridge, however, he realized it was the wrong time to ask prying questions about the condition of the corpse. 
two police cars were parked in the driveway, one from the sheriff's department and the other from the state trooper's post. Furthermore, the sign on the front lawn was covered with a burlap sack, a signal that there were no baked goods for sale. He made a U-turn and returned to Mooseville. Back in town, he went into the post office and found some more postcards from Polly. He had complained while driving her to the airport that she never kept in touch while on vacation. She had replied with a cryptic smile that she would do something about it. Doing something about it meant mailing six cards a week, a kind of playful overkill. In the lobby of the post office, he saw a young woman he knew unlocking a rental box and scooping handfuls of mail into a tote bag. What are you doing here? he asked. Shouldn't you be at home, homeschooling your brats around the kitchen table? She was Sharon Hanstable, plump, good-natured, and wholesomely pretty, a young version of her mother, Mildred Riker. She was also the wife of Roger McGillivray, a reporter for the Moose County something. I work part-time at the Great Dune Motel, she explained, and Roger's home with the kids today. He takes the weekend shift at the paper so we can have two weekdays free. Both parents were former teachers. Sharon, after leaving that career to raise a family, was always popping up in part-time roles as a cashier or sales clerk or short-order cook. This was an aspect of small-town life that still astounded Quillerin. "'If you're on your way to work,' he said, "'I'll walk with you and carry your mail.' "'Are you still enthusiastic about homeschooling?' he asked as they headed for Sandpit Road. "'It's a big job and a serious responsibility, but also a challenge and a joy,' she replied." We spend more time with our kids in positive ways. Would you like to try a session of teaching some afternoon, Quill? No, thanks. I'll take your word for it. Mother takes a day once in a while so Roger and I can get away. Your mother is a former teacher. What's more, she has a heart of gold and the patience of a saint. She probably enjoys being a grandmother. They had pushed through the heavy pedestrian traffic on Main Street and were walking down Sandpit Road. Sharon said, Did you hear that they found the backpacker? It'll be in today's paper. Roger's been on the story since Wednesday, and he happens to know they've sent the body to the state pathologist, although they're not releasing the information. There's something unusual about the death. She lowered her voice. Mother and Roger and I think it has something to do with the visitors from outer space. Is that so? He murmured. Don't mention it to Arch. You know how he is. Couldn't you gently talk some sense into his head, Quill? I doubt whether I'm the one to try, Quillerin said with tact. How do you explain all this to your youngsters? We tell them the universe has room for many worlds, some with intelligent life. Alien beings are curious about our planet just as we're interested in getting to Mars and beyond. Have your kids sighted any of these... Visitors? No, we're away from the water and don't stay up late. Mother says 2 a.m. is the best time for sightings. They had reached the Great Dune Motel, and he handed over the tote bag. Have you been to lunch at Owen's place? Too expensive. I carry my lunch. Also, my boss is miffed because they're staying at the hotel instead of with us. Owen's place stood alone on the west side of the highway, although its stained cedar siding matched that of the motel, antique shop, fudge kitchen, and other enterprises on the east side. It had been a coin-operated laundry for several seasons before becoming an unsuccessful Chinese restaurant. Now, in the large front windows, the red velvet draperies of its bok choy period had been replaced with white louvered shutters. With the parking lot paved and the great dune as a noble background, it looked quite elegant, and Quillerin looked forward to dining there before the theater. The Chamber of Commerce must have offered Bowen a good deal, Quillerin thought. Otherwise, why would a man with contempt for country folk choose to spend the summer 400 miles north of everywhere? Evidently, the lake was the attraction since he had a boat. A recreation vehicle with a boat hitch could be seen around the rear of the restaurant, as well as a white convertible, both with Florida tags. Walking back toward Main Street, Quillerin passed Arnold's antique shop and stopped short. 
There in the window was the kind of spindly, high-backed antique chair that had been on the float with the sheep. It was a chair design with character, and it aroused his curiosity. He went into the shop. There were several customers, either buying or browsing. According to their dress and mannerisms, Quillerin could classify them as campers or wives of sport fishermen or boaters from the Grand Island Club who had just lunched at Owen's place. The lunch crowd was raving about the chef, the quiche, the skewered potatoes, and the perfectly darling maitre d'. Arnold himself was everywhere at once. He was an ageless man with tireless energy, but he had a weathered face that looked like the old wood carvings he sold. Peering over rimless glasses, he sorted the idle browsers from the potential customers and kept an eye on the former. A long-haired white and black dog wagged a plumed tail at the latter. Good dog, good dog, Quillerin said to him. Hi, Mr. Q. You like our pooch? Arnold asked. He just wandered in one day, a friendly soul. Brings in more business than an ad in your newspaper. What's his name? Well, you see, we bought a job lot of China that included a dog dish with the name Freddy on it, so we named the dog to match the dish. Excuse me. Arnold went off to take a customer's money. A man was buying a rusty iron wheel, four feet in diameter, but delicate in its proportions with 16 slender spokes. Beautiful rust job, smooth as honey, the dealer told the purchaser. It threshed a lot of wheat in its day. Meanwhile, Quillerin poked through baskets of arrowheads, Civil War bullets, and old English coins. What's that guy going to do with the wheel? He later asked Arnold. Hang it over the fireplace in his lodge on Grand Island. Hmm, I could use one of those myself. He was thinking of the gable end above his own fireplace, a large blank wall that had originally displayed a mounted moose head. Its doer expression had been a depressing reminder of animal rights. Later, the wall showcased a collection of lumberjack tools, axes, a peavy, and cross-cut saws with murderous two-inch teeth equally discomforting. A wheel, on the other hand. There were two of them from a field combine, Arnold said. The other one's in my main store in Lockmaster. I'll have it sent up here, but it'll take a couple, three days. No rush. I'd also like to inquire about the chair in the window. What is it? There were eight of them on a float in yesterday's parade. That's a pressed back dining chair circa 1900, sometimes thought of as a kitchen chair. In the country, a lot of dining was done in the kitchen. In 1904 or thereabouts, the Sears catalog offered this chair for 94 cents. Did you hear me right? 94 cents. They must have sold millions of them. Pretty thing, ain't it? There's something debonair about it, Quitterin said. It was golden oak, heavily varnished, with a hand-caned seat and nine turned spindles, almost pencil-thin, and a deep top rail that had a decorative design pressed into it. Two turned finials on top, like ears, gave it a playful fillet but would be practical hand grips. The dealer said, This may have been a knockoff of an earlier and more expensive design, with the top rail carved and a price tag more like $250. The ones I've seen around here are all in the 94 cent class. The seat on this one has been recaned. I'll make you a good price if you're interested. I'll think about it, Quillerin said, meaning that he had no intention of buying. But I'll definitely come back for the wheel in a couple of days. What do you know about the restaurant across the way? He added as Arnold accompanied him to the door. I hear the food's good. Have you had contact with Owen Bowen? Only through Derek. He's working there part-time, you know. Derek said the entry, where customers wait to be seated, needed some spark, so we put our heads together, and I lent them a setup for the summer months, some Waterford crystal in a lighted china cabinet. We brought it up from the Lockmaster store, and that so-and-so from Florida never picked up the phone to say thank you, let alone send over a piece of pie. Freddy has better manners than Owen Bowen. Quillerin's watch told him that the lunch hour had ended at Owen's place, and his intuition had told him that Derek would be heading for Elizabeth's magic to relax and report on events. Quillerin headed in the same direction, stopping only for a hot dog and two copies of the Moose County something. On the way, he thought about another reader participation stunt. He could take a census of pressed back chairs in Moose County, run a photograph of the one at Arnold's, ask... Do you own one or more of these historic artifacts? 
send us a postcard. Arch Riker chaffed Quillerin about his postcard parties, although he knew very well that subscribers looked forward to the monthly assignments and talked about them all over the county. On Oak Street, there were three contiguous storefronts, each with a window box of petunias, Elizabeth's magic in the center, flanked by a realty agent and a hairstylist. When Quillerin opened the door, an overhead bell jangled, and three persons turned in his direction, Elizabeth and two customers of retirement age, one tall and one short. They had been his neighbors in Indian Village. Ladies, what brings you to the haunts of Coot and Hearn? he asked. They greeted him happily. That's Tennyson, said the tall one. My favorite poem, The Brook, said the other. They were the Cavendish sisters, retired from distinguished teaching careers down below. Quillerin had rescued one of their cats when it became entangled in the laundry equipment. I hear you're living in Itty Bitty Wassey Estates, he said. Yes, they gave us an apartment with pet privileges. We'd never go anywhere without Pinky and Quinky. We're here to see the play tonight. They have an activities bus that takes residents on day trips. How is Coco? And how is that dear Yum Yum? They find the beach stimulated, he said, and the screened porch is their university. Coco studies the constellations at night and does graduate work in crow behavior during the day. He's such an intellectual cat, said the tall sister. Yum Yum is majoring in entomology, but yesterday distinguished herself by saving a life. Really? the sisters said in unison. You know how birds knock themselves groggy by trying to fly through a window screen or pane of glass? Well, a hummingbird flew into the porch screen and got its long beak caught in the mesh. It was fluttering desperately until Yum Yum jumped to a nearby chair back and gave the beak a gentle push with her paw. She's so sweet, the short sister said. Wouldn't you know she'd be a humanitarian, the other one said. More likely, she thought it was a bug on the screen, Quillerin mused. The bell over the door jangled, and they all turned to see Derek Cuddlebrink barging into the shop. Just got off work, he announced. Five hours till curtain time. Got any coffee? He loped to the rear of the store. Quillerin followed after exchanging pleasantries with the sisters and giving Elizabeth one of his newspapers. The two men sat in the black nylon sling chairs with plastic cups of coffee. I never touch the stuff when I'm on duty, Derek said. How's business? Great at lunchtime. I'm not there at night, so I don't know what kind of crowd they get for dinner. Do you and your boss hit it off well? Oh, sure, we get along. He needs me and he knows it. I don't have to take any of his guff. He lowered his voice. I know more about the food business than he does. At least, I've cracked a book or two. He's just a Joe who likes to eat and thinks it would be a kick to own a restaurant. They're wrong. It's one of the hardest, most complicated businesses you could pick. Owen happened to latch on to a great chef. She's a creative artist, trained at one of the best chef schools. She's really dedicated. Besides that, she's a nice person, much younger than he is. And not as stuffy. He expects to be called Mr. Bowen. She says, call me Ernie. Her name is Ernestine. She works like a dog in the kitchen while he goofs off and goes fishing. Whatever he happens to reel in, I suppose, goes on the menu as catch of the day at market price. Well, no. It's a funny thing, but Owen says Ernie isn't comfortable with lake fish being a Floridian, so he fishes for the sport. Whatever he catches, he throws back. The guy's nuts. Hmm, Cullerin said, smoothing his mustache. What's your best seller at lunchtime? Skewered potatoes, hands down. I've heard people talk about them. What are they? Derek yelled. Liz, got any skewers left? A few, she said. I've placed another order, and Mike's turning them out as fast as he can, but we can hardly keep up with the demand. She showed Quillerin a set of the foot-long needles of twisted iron with sharp points. At the opposite end, each had a decorative medallion for a finger grip. She said... If you bake potatoes on skewers, the baking time is shortened and they're flakier, more flavorful, and more nutritious. Who says so? Quillerin said, it sounds like a scam to me. I don't know how it originated, but it seems to be an accepted fact. It was Derek's idea to put skewered potatoes on the menu, and Ernie bought a dozen to start. Now she wants more. Here's why they're popular, Derek said. The potatoes are unskewered and dressed at tableside for dramatic effect. 
Dining in a fine restaurant is part showbiz, you know. People like the special attention they get with table-side service, like filleting a trout or tossing a Caesar salad or flaming a dessert. I do the ritual myself. I put on a good show. Come and have lunch someday. I'll do that. Meanwhile, I'm having dinner there tonight before the play. That reminds me. He jumped out of his chair and headed for the front door. Break a leg, Quillerin shouted after him. Quill, have you seen today's paper? Elizabeth asked. Look at the announcement on page five. He unfolded the newspaper he had been carrying and read a boxed announcement. You ain't seen nothing yet, Hardy. Do you like the way folks speak in Moose County? Do you have pet peeves about English as she is spoken? Do you think whom should be eliminated from the English language? Are you confused about him and me and he and I? Ask Ms. Grandma. Her column starts next week on this page. Write to her at the Moose County something. Queries and complaints will receive her attention. Well, that's a surprise, to say the least, Quillerin said. Readers have been clamoring for editorial comment on the sloppy English common in Moose County, but it remains to be seen whether a column on good grammar will accomplish anything. What's your reaction, Elizabeth? Frankly, I think the people who need it most won't read it, and what's more, they see nothing wrong with the way they speak. Their patois was learned from their parents and is spoken most likely by their friends. Quillerin said, My question is, who will write it? Jill Hanley on the staff could do it, or some retired teacher of English, but that's Junior Goodwinter's problem. We'll wait and see. Before going home, Quillerin drove to Fishport once more. The burlap sack was still covering the sign on the lawn, but there were no police cars in the drive. Quillerin thought he could knock on the door and ask, as a friend, how things were going. Is there anything I can do was always a key to unlocking confidences. He knocked on the door, and no one answered. He knocked again. Someone could be seen moving around inside the house. Someone who obviously did not want to be bothered. He drove away. Chapter 6 before going to dinner in the theater, Quillerin fed the cats and treated them to a reading session. They were currently enjoying the sheep book, far from the madding crowd. They usually sat on the porch, Quillerin in a lounge chair, Yum Yum on his lap, and Coco on the back of the chair, looking over his shoulder. If Quillerin dramatized the story, Coco would get excited and inch forward, then the cat's whiskers would tickle the man's ear. The episode that Quillerin read on this occasion was an ear tickler, the tragic event for which the novel was famous. An inexperienced sheepdog made a fatal mistake. His sire, old George, had the wisdom of a veteran sheepkeeper, but the young one had too much enthusiasm and too little sense. His job was to chase sheep, and he chased them. It was the jangling of bells on fast-running sheep that alerted the farmer one dark night. He called the dogs, and only George responded. Shouting the shepherd's cry of, Ovi, 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 the man ran to the hill. There were no sheep in sight, but the young dog was standing on the edge of the chalk cliff, gazing down below. He had chased the flock until they broke through a hedge and a rail fence and plunged to their death. Lost were two hundred ewes and the two hundred lambs they would have birthed. The farmer was financially ruined, and the poor dog was shot. Quillerin slapped the book shut. He had been reading with emotion, and his listeners sensed the tension in his voice. Though it described a 19th-century farm in a fictional English county called Wessex, it resembled Moose County, where sheep farming supported so many families. There was a heavy silence on the porch, until the telephone rang. Excuse me, he said, dislodging Yum Yum from his lap. The caller was Sarah Plensdorf, the conscientious office manager at the something. I'm sorry to bother you on your vacation, Quill, but I had a request for your phone number from a woman who seemed very young and very shy. When I told her to write you a letter, she insisted that she had an urgent message for you. I took her number and said I'd try to reach you. She was calling from Fishport. Give me the number, I'll call her, he said. 
You handled it well, Sarah. You're to ask for Janelle. When he phoned the number, a soft, whispery voice said, Safe Harbor Residence. He had to think a moment. Was this the home for widows of commercial fishermen? He said, Is there someone there by the name of Janelle? This is Janelle, she said hesitantly. Is this Mr. Quillerin? Yes, you called my office. Her slowness of speech made him speak in a clipped manner. You have an urgent message? It's from one of our residents, the widow of Primus Hawley. She's made a lovely gift for you. He huffed into his mustache. That would be Doris Hawley's mother-in-law. She was embroidering something for him, probably home sweet home, bordered with roses. He glanced at Coco, who was at his elbow, listening. Very kind of her, he said. Would it be too much trouble to pick it up? She's 90 years old. She'd be thrilled to meet you. Coco was staring at his forehead, and Quillerin found himself saying, No trouble at all. I have great respect for the commercial fishing community. I wrote a column on the blessing of the fleet this spring. I know. We have it in the parlor, in a lovely frame. I'll drop in someday next week. Could you come sooner? She asked in her shy but persistent way. Well, then, Monday afternoon. There was a pause. Sooner? All right, he said in exasperation. Sometime tomorrow afternoon. There was another pause. Could you tell us exactly when she has to have her nap? After promising to be there at two o'clock, Quillerin hung up and was surprised to see Coco running around in circles. If you could drive, he said to the cat, I'd send you to pick it up. When Quillerin arrived at Owen's place, the first thing he noticed in the small foyer was a lighted case of sparkling cut crystal. He looked for a card saying, courtesy of Arnold's, but there was no credit given. Otherwise, the interior was mostly white with accents of pink and yellow and a great many potted plants, hanging baskets and indoor trees. He could tell at a glance that they were from the greenery in Lockmaster, a place that rented plastic foliage for all occasions. Altogether, it was not a bad scene. The large casement windows on both long walls were open, and their white louvered shutters framed them pleasantly. Half the tables were taken, and there was a hum of excitement from showgoers headed for an opening night performance. For a beach crowd, they were dressed decently, and Quillerin was glad he had worn his striped seersucker coat. As he stood waiting in the entry, several heads were turned in his direction and hands waved. Owen Bowen, handsomely tanned, came forward with a frown wrinkling his fine features. Reservation? No, sorry. The host scanned the room. How many? One. That required another study of the situation. Smoking or non-smoking? None. After painful cogitation, he conducted Quillerin to a small table and said, Something from the bar. Squunk water on the rocks with lemon zest. What was that? Quillerin repeated it and explained that it was a mineral water from a natural spring at Squunk Corners, but he said he would settle for club soda. The menu was unusual by Moose County standards. Veal loin encrusted with eggplant, spinach, and roasted red peppers, with sun-dried tomato demi-glaze, that sort of thing. Quillerin played it safe with a lamb shank buco on a bed of basil fettuccine. The soup of the day was a puree of cauliflower and gorgonzola served in a soup plate with three spears of chives arranged in a triangle on the creamy surface. While a self-conscious waitstaff took orders and served the food, the host seated guests and served drinks with an air of zero hospitality. Latticework in the rear of the room screened the bar, the cash register, and a window into the kitchen where Quillerin caught glimpses of a young woman in a chef's towering took. Her face had a look of extreme concentration and a kitchen pallor. Other diners started leaving at 7.15, saying they were concerned about parking facilities. 
When Quillerin arrived at the Botts farm, vehicles lined both shoulders of the highway as far as one could see, and others were being directed into designated pastures. He himself had a press card that admitted him to a lot behind the dairy barn. Showgoers gathered in the barnyard, reluctant to go indoors. It was a beautiful evening, and this was a festive celebration. The Rikers were there. How was Owen's place? they asked. Quillerin was pleased to report that the food was excellent. The chef is nouvelle, but not too nouvelle. The host is a cold fish. If you don't like cold fish, I suggest you go for lunch when Derek is on duty. Then, half turning his back to Arch, he asked Mildred, has your sensitive husband recovered from the mortification of knitting in public? Don't be fooled, Quill. He's enjoying the notoriety. He even got a fan letter from a mechanic in Chipmunk. Arch said, I hope the play's better than the pre-curtain conversation. Let's go in. Curtain time, an usher was shouting to the crowd milling about the barnyard. There was no curtain in the theater, and there were no backs on the seats. Bleachers, providing good sight lines, filled one end of the barn while an elevated stage occupied the other. Although the set was sketchy, the audience could imagine a fashionable country house with a terrace off to the right. The lights dimmed, the haunting electronic sounds faded, and the play began, with headstrong characters insisting that UFOs were figments of the imagination. Meanwhile, a spaceship was landing in a rose garden off stage with green lights spilling on stage. Enter a visitor from outer space, almost seven feet tall. The audience howled as they recognized their favorite actor. He wore a Civil War uniform and sideburns and explained to the Earthlings that he had miscalculated and landed in the wrong century. It was a challenging role for Derek, who was in almost every scene of the play. During intermission, when the audience was glad to leave the bleachers for a few minutes, Quillerin listened to their comments. Elizabeth Hart, isn't he talented? He does everything well. Lyle Compton, will that guy ever stop growing? Arch Riker, this play puts UFOs where they belong in a comic strip. Junior Goodwinter, I hear tickets are sold out for three weekends. Obviously, Derek was stealing the show. All his groupies were there, overreacting to every line. After the last act and after the last tumultuous applause had shivered the timbers of the old barn, it was a joyful crowd that poured out to the barnyard. Junior grabbed Quillerin's arm. How about lunch tomorrow and some shop talk? I have some ideas to bounce around. You come to Mooseville and I'll buy, Quillerin said. I have a two o'clock appointment in Fishport. We'll go to Owen's place and see Derek in a different role. Then he found Arch waiting for Mildred. He was standing near an arrow that pointed to the portable facilities behind the barn. Quillerin said, Apart from the hard seats, how did you like the show? I hope it's not going to stir up a lot more UFO fever. People have brainwashed themselves, and my wife is one of the nuts. Well, I listened to their conversation politely, Quillerin said, but I don't buy it, of course. I've stopped being polite. Enough is enough. Toulouse sits staring into space, the way cats do, and Mildred insists he's watching for visitors. Here she comes now. Sorry to keep you both waiting, she said. There was a long line. Quill, would you like to stop at our place for a snack? Thanks, but I want to go home and grapple with my review while the show's fresh in my mind. We're parked half a mile away, Art said. Where are you parked? Behind the barn. Reviewer's privilege. Lucky dog. I run the paper and I have to walk half a mile. I'll make a deal, Quillerin said. You write the review and I'll drive you to your car. It was no deal.